Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala al-mursaleen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everyone. Welcome to tonight's uh, lecture on the, the better one, the Big Bang, and the Kalam cosmological argument for the existence of God with Sheikh Hamza Karamali. Tonight's talk is brought to you by both Basira Education and Mizan Avenue. And it's the first of a three-part lecture series scheduled to happen over the next three months. So uh, do stay posted on, you know, I guess, follow us on Crowdhouse, Instagram, social media, and, and, and sign up for our emails as well. And as the, the next two talks are scheduled, you will inform you that, of that through, through email, inshallah. Obviously, we've got Sheikh Hamza Karamali joining us tonight, who is from uh, Batira Education. Um, so for those of you who, who aren't familiar, uh, Batira Education pretty much runs a, a lot of uh, religious curricula that's taught at home or in the mosque. Um, it, it pretty much focuses on uh, filling the gap between a lot of uh, the worldview that um, uh, that a lot of the institutions that uh, tend to miss out on. So um, their about our statement pretty much reads that religious curricula that is that is taught at home or in the mosque often tends to be disconnected from the curricula that children and young adults are taught in schools and colleges. Uh, the education's goal is to help conservative Muslim parents pass on their religious worldview to their children by providing a religious a religious curriculum that is thoroughly grounded in the traditional Islamic sciences while explicitly engaging the difficult questions raised by the physical sciences and the human humanities in the curricula of modern schools and colleges. Their mission statement is to develop intel intelligent and conservative Muslims whose grounding in the, in the Muslim scholarly and spiritual traditions enables them to critically integrate modern science and culture into their religious worldview. So Bashir Education does have some courses that are open for registration. If you look at the uh, the bottom of the screen, you should see a, a green button that says Bashir course registration is open. If you just click that, it'll take uh, take you directly to their website with a list of their courses. They have uh, weekly courses and weekly seminars where, and it's not just a, a teacher speaking to you. You can also get involved and, and it's very interactive as well. So we do encourage you to to jump on it as well. Mashallah, there's a there's a lot of online content and inshallah, there's there's a lot to benefit from. Uh, from Brasier Education as well, so um, but I definitely encourage you to click that link and and to register. Just to uh, to quickly introduce our guest, and so, so we can commence uh, tonight's session. Sheikh Hamza Karamali earned his his bachelor's and his master's in computer engineering at the University of Toronto. After which he moved abroad to study the Islamic sciences full time in private one on one settings with distinguished traditional scholars in Jordan, Kuwait, and, and the UAE, reading and memorizing traditional works in all of the Islamic sciences. He taught the Islamic sciences online at sunnipath.com, then at qibla.com, then taught advanced Arabic grammar and rhetoric at the Pasad Institute, and then joined the Kalam Research and Media, where he worked for three years, designing, managing, and participating in research and education projects around the integration of modern analytic philosophy and science with traditional Islamic theology and logic. He's the author of the Madrasa Curriculum in Context, as well as a forthcoming work that presents, presents traditional Islamic logic in the idiom of contemporary logic and philosophy. He was a senior instructor at Seekers Guidance, where he oversees the STEPS curriculum and teaches courses in logic, legal theory, Islamic theology, and sacred law. He also produces a regular podcast and video series called Why Islam is True, in which he applies logic and traditional Islamic theology to answer contemporary questions about belief in God the genuine messenger of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the truth of resurrection and the afterlife. As an informed father of six children, he has a special interest in the religious education of children and young adults in order to prepare them for their independent lives in the modern world. Over the last three years, he has applied his experiences to the development of religious education programs for the children of a group of religious and conservative parents in Amman, Jordan. Basira Education, which um, I just introduced earlier, is one of these programs that has grown as grown out of it as a way to help religious parents all over the world. Alhamdulillah, we are incredibly blessed to have you here tonight with us, Sheikh. Um, I'm going to stop yapping on and hand it straight over to you uh, so we can begin tonight's session. Mm -hmm. um, thanks for the introduction. So I will um, make a couple of corrections that that uh, biography is a bit outdated. Um, it uh, It's from when I began uh, Basira um, about a year ago. Um, so when I when I began Basira about a year ago, it was intended for um, young adults, um, it, for children, young adults, teenagers in their high school and college years. Um, but um, as the project developed, 
uh, it uh, there was a significant interest from adults as well. So it's grown into something else. So it's for uh, for young adults and also for adults. Um, and uh, I was at that point when the biography was written, I was working at Seekers Guidance, but I no longer work for them. My, all my work right now happens at uh, Basira Education. Um, so Basira, it, uh, it, this is related to our talk today. And it, it uh, grew out. So I have, uh, I have a background in uh, the education that all of you had. So I went to high school in Canada. Um, I did my master's, um, bachelor's and master's in engineering. I have an education in science. Um, I've worked in the um, in, as a as a software um, engineer and also as a in, in the hardware industry. Um, so uh, and so I'm I'm uh, I have so I come from the same educational background that all of you come from. Um, but I always had an interest from a young age in um, the religious sciences. And uh, when I, during the time that I spent studying the religious sciences, um, I always, uh, there was a, I, there's, there's a lot of depth in the old books, in the old books of Tafsir, in the old books of Usul, in the old books of rational theology, in the old books of logic. Um, our scholars, they were very intelligent men and women. Um, now, uh, but the things that they talk about are, uh, are they don't directly relate to the world that we experience around us. So uh, there there's, appears to be a gap and that gap needs to be filled because in order for what we learn in, our, in the traditional Islamic sciences to speak to us directly, it needs to, uh, be, uh, it needs to address issues, it needs to connect with what we see around us. And one area of that uh, connect Connect, uh, that uh, connection that needs to be made is modern science. So uh, modern science um, is, uh, so this also grew out of a number of um, experiences that I had uh, working with professional philosophers and professional scientists. Uh, and uh, as, a, as a religious theologian with a background in, in uh, uh, like an amateur background in, uh, in philosophy and a semi-professional background in science, um, so the, what I found was that the uh, Muslim uh, presence in uh, Muslims uh, who, ha who are trained in the Islamic sciences, their presence in the, uh, their voices in the mainstream discourse on these issues is missing. Their voices are missing. And, uh, and often when their voices are there, they are there on the tongue of someone else. And we're gonna to get to the Kalam cosmological argument. I'll give you a brief history of that. And uh, we, have, uh, we have a lot to offer. And there are, a, there are many things that, that uh, many problems, many philosophical problems, many scientific problems that we as Muslims with our uh, tradition are uniquely placed to solve. And that's what today's class is about. So today's class, where I'm going to go back, I'm going to go back 1,400 years um, into the Arabian desert. And there was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he is speaking to a Bedouin. A Bedouin, probably unlettered, uh, he mines his camels, pitches his tent, grazes his camels for a period of time, and then uh, packs up his tent and goes and lives somewhere else where the pasturage is better. And then that life continues. So he lives a nomadic life, um, far from civilization, lives with his camels. He came to the Prophet wasallam, and he asked him a question. This hadith is narrated in Sahih al-Bukhari. He said to the Prophet wasallam, he said, he asked him a question. He said, what is it? Why is it that, uh, that when, uh, when somebody has camels and I keep them in the desert. I have camels and I keep them in the desert away from the, from the camel markets in the cities. These camels, they remain healthy. But when there is a camel with scabies, scabies is a skin disease that exists in camels. If there's a, if there is a, uh, if there's a camel that comes and then uh, a scabiotic camel and, uh, and it, mixes with this herd of, uh, of healthy camels, 
they acquire the same disease, scabies, contagious infection. Uh, a very um, uh, you know timely hadith in the age of COVID contagious <laughs> infection. So uh, so maybe you know in our times maybe somebody would say that okay let's let's get the camels masks or close them in uh, some kind of plastic suit and have social distancing and have disinfectants to 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 uh, to prevent the the transmission of the scabies. Um, and so the 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 Arabi. The, 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 the red when he came and he said that uh, he asked him this question. Why did he ask him this question? He asked him this question because just before the Prophet وسلم, had made a statement. And his statement was, he says, La adwa. there's no such thing as contagious infection. And he mentioned a number of other things, but we're going to focus on this idea of contagious infection. So he says, there's no such thing as contagious infection. And so the, the Bedouin said that, well, what about this phenomenon? You know, I see contagious infection. And right now, we look around us, we see contagious infection. So the Prophet وسلم, he asked him a question. Yeah, he said, فَمَنْ أَعْدَى الْأَوَّلَى He said, who is it that contagiously infected the first camel to get scabies? So this is a very profound argument. It's a very profound argument, and it's an argument that is that has been rediscovered in recent times. I'm going to show you how that argument has been rediscovered. But before I show you how that argument has been rediscovered, let's take a moment to understand it. So if we say that uh, that there is, we'll stick with the Bedouins and the camels, and you can make your own extrapolations to COVID. Uh, so the, if we say that there's a camel, and the camel was healthy, and then it becomes scabietic, and we say that the scabies in that camel was caused by another camel. So we say, okay, where did the scabies come from? Okay, this camel got, got scabietic. It needs something to make it scabietic. Where did the scabies come from? And so we point to another camel. We say that there it was. It came from that camel. I just saw you. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to everybody who gave salams. Apologies, didn't see it earlier. Um, didn't notice it earlier. So, so we point to another camel and we say that this camel is the camel that gave this camel the scabies. But then we ask the same question about this camel. We say, okay, this camel got scabies. Where did it come from? And then we say, okay, there's another one. And that also has scabies. And we say, okay, where did that scabies come from? From another camel. Okay, where did that scabies come from? And we keep on going and the key thing to understand, the key thing that I want you to understand is that it cannot go on without end. Why not? This is a relationship of dependence. There's no relationship of dependence that can go on without end into the past. I'll give you an example. So let's say that I am, um, not me, inshallah, somebody else, uh, alhamdulillah, uh, Allah has blessed me and I ask Allah to keep, keep, keep these blessings on me and on all of you, blessing of health. But let's say that there's somebody who is not feeling well. So they can't stand up straight. And so they, go, oh, so I need to lean on somebody. And they lean back and they're leaning on somebody. And there happens to be a person behind them and he catches them. But that person himself is feeling a little bit weak. Or maybe the person who's sick is very heavy. He says, oh, I can't support you. I'm going to fall down. And he goes like that. And there's somebody, but luckily there's somebody else behind him who catches him. But that person also is unable to support these two because of his own health issues. And so he says, oh, two people. The first person only had to support one. Now he has to support two. He says, oh, I can't do this. And he falls down. And then another person catches him. And so we take this, so this is what philosophers do, right? So philosophers, they make hypothetical cases that sound crazy, but they illustrate points. So, so, uh, so, 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 so just take this case and I want you to understand this. So there's, so you see this, this hypothetical case and there's person falling, 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 and you look and it goes out the door. And as far as you can see, there, there's one person falling on another person, falling on another person. And it goes past the horizon and you don't know what's past the horizon. But you look at the first person 
who fell backwards, and you see that he is being supported. You see that he's not falling down on, on the ground. What will you conclude? You're going to conclude that at the end of the line, there is a really strong person, or maybe it's some object like a mountain or something like that, that is supporting all of these weak individuals and keeping them standing. So there's something at the end that doesn't need to be supported by anything else. And if that thing was not there, then this entire line of people would be lying on their backs like that. The fact that the person at the beginning of the line is still standing is evidence that, that the line ends at someone, something that is supporting everything and does not need to be supported by anything. Okay? So, so now let's come to the camels. We apply the same idea to the camels. The camels, they, uh, they, they need to be supported. So what's their support? Their support is a camel doesn't get scabies on its own. There's something that needs to give it scabies. So it's dependent on another camel to give it scabies. And that camel is dependent, dependent, dependent. It's the same chain of dependency of one person leaning on another, leaning on another all the way past the horizon. So at the end, right at the, this whole thing needs to needs to depend on someone, something that causes the scabies, that makes a camel scabietic, but itself is not given the scabies by anything else. That's the question of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Man a'da al-awwal? Man a'da al-awwal? Who is it that contagiously infected the first camel? And now I want you to take this example and generalize it to the entire universe. So generalize it to the entire universe. Everything in the universe is needy. What does it mean for it to be needy? Well, if you look around you, so uh, you know, you know, in, the, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about nature because the things that were around people were nature. It talks about the wind and the rain and the sun and the moon and the clouds. Now, in the age of COVID, we're all locked inside our rooms. We can't even see people and all in artificial lighting and, uh, and computer screens. And so, so if, uh, so, 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 but the same principles apply. The same principles apply that the, everything that you see around you, it's dependent. The computer screen that you see around you, it needs someone to make it. The wall that you see in front of you needs someone to make it. The, if you look outside, just open the window. So it's still daytime here in Istanbul. So you guys are at nighttime in Australia. So I, I, I look outside, I see the sunlight. The sun, the sunlight needs something for it to be there. And we all know that because when you study science, you say, what makes the sun shine? And you say nuclear fusion. When you study science, you ask the question, what makes the wind blow? And you say, for example, a, a difference in air pressure in two, in two locations. When you study science, you ask the question, what makes the rain fall? And they'll tell you condensation and, uh, you know, and the clouds and all of these other things, water cycle. And so they'll, so, but the, what is science about? Science is about asking what makes the things in the universe the way that they are. Why does, is this like this? Is this like this? And this like this? And we search for scientific explanations. With the sun, we say nuclear fusion. With the wind, we say difference in air pressure. With something else, we'll give another reason. But Hold on a second. The reason that I'm that, that that a scientist gives for any 
thing that you see in the universe. For example, the sun shines. What's the reason? Nuclear fusion. Hydrogen atoms coming together to form helium atoms and releasing energy that uh, that we can we now see you know that, that that's the light that we that we sense. But then you ask the question: Why is it that helium atoms, hydrogen atoms, come together to form a helium atom in this particular way? And a scientist asks this question and will formulate answers to that question. And there'll be you know, something to do with the uh, forces, the subatomic forces between the subatomic particles, and a loss in mass, conversion of mass to energy. And then you ask the same question again: Why is this like this? And then you get something else. And then you ask the same question again, and you say, "Why is this like this?" And you get something else. So uh, this is this is what science is about. Science is about explaining the the things that we see around us in terms of other things that we see around us, and then those things in terms of other things, and then those things in terms of other things, and all of these things are within the universe. But everything in the universe is dependent. Everything in the universe needs something to make it the way that it is. Every single thing in the universe. And we perceive this. You perceive this. I perceive this. You don't need an argument to, to see this. You look at the, you look, go anywhere. Like you go to the, you go to the beach, you see the waves strike the shore and you search for an explanation for why the waves strike the shore and where they come from. You hear the birds chirping and you, and you seek an explanation. What is it that, 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 uh, that causes this beautiful voice to come out of them? You see a seagull flying. Okay. Uh, and you ask a similar question. Why is it that birds, they stay in the air? And you, for every single thing in the universe, you're going to ask this question because every single thing in the universe is dependent. Dependent. So philosophers have a term for this. They call this contingency. They say it's contingent. We're going to, I'm going to put that, that technical term aside. I'm going, to, I'm going to just use this term dependence, which is, uh, which we can all understand. And now I want you, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the argument that the Bedouin made, the Bedouin or the prophet made to the Bedouin about who is it that contagiously infected the first camel. And we're going to extend it to the, to the universe. And it leads us to a conclusion. It leads us to a conclusion because if the universe, everything in the universe is dependent, and we're searching, and we're searching to explain one dependency in terms of another dependent thing. And then that leads us to ask the question, what gave, what fulfilled the dependency of this thing? And then what fulfilled the dependency of this thing, and this thing, and this thing, and so on. And we see around us that things exist. Things are actually here. There's this dependence, and these, but these things are here. What does this mean? It means that the universe is dependent on something, on someone who does not need anything. And that is, uh, philosophers, they call this a necessary being. A necessary being is, we have a term, this is, these are all terms, philosophers use this, and these terms are, are, they're native to us. Contingency, necessity, there, if you study Islamic theology, traditional Islamic theology, these terms are, this is part of our tradition. You find this in books of tafsir. When you, if you open up any, any, uh, any classical tafsir, you're going to find that when the first time that the word Allah is mentioned, they define Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a necessary being, the one who everybody needs and nobody else needs. So, and there's other verses as well in the Quran that, uh, that, that points to this. Um, for uh, the, the I'm, I'll, I have, there's other material on the Basir Education website, we have a YouTube channel, uh, we have a mailing list, and I'll, uh, you can, shall, I'll, I'll refer you to browse those areas to, uh, to find out more about this. Um, uh, there, uh, there's also a course that, that, I, that I teach called Why Islam is True, which is, this is uh, a, a, it's basically an elaboration of, of what we're doing here and what we'll be doing over the next three months. So the, uh, 
but I want you just to now just to understand that the universe depends on someone who doesn't depend on anyone. And this is the most important characteristic of Godhood from an Islamic perspective. This is who Allah is. This is why we worship him. We worship him because we need him and he doesn't need us. He doesn't need anyone. That's what we are saying when we prostrate ourselves to him in our sujood. So this here, this is an, this is an argument for the existence of God. And the Prophet وسلم, he made it with this Bedouin and it's actually throughout the Quran. There's barely a page in the Quran that doesn't have this argument in it. And, uh, and it's not an exaggeration. Um, uh, but we're going to, again, like this is, there's other, I want, there's a focus that I want to keep here. I'll leave that as something for you to think about. You can explore it in other, other, other places. But what we want to, what we, what we want is now there's a, this is, this is God. God exists. Okay. So this, this is the Bedouin. This is the Bedouin. Uh, now let's talk about the Big Bang. So, uh, so the Big Bang, uh, it is, uh, it's actually, it's a misnomer because it wasn't big and it wasn't a bang. So the Big Bang, uh, you know, people, uh, I teach, uh, I teach young adults and I teach adults as well, but often people, they, uh, they say, and I talk, talk the Big Bang, they said, yeah, it means that there's two things that came and they collided with each other and there's a big explosion and that's where the universe came from. That's not, that's not, that's not what the Big Bang is, right? The Big Bang, uh, some people they they describe it as a as an inflation event, expansion event, cosmic expansion event. What is the Big Bang theory? The Big Bang theory, which is um, it is uh, you know all scientific uh, in science you call things theories because they're testable and you and you uh, and you bring evidence and you challenge it and you do all of these things. Um, but big, the Big Bang theory is it's basically fact. There's scientific consensus on this, and so. Don't, uh, uh, you know, don't be, um, it's, uh, so people say science changes, things can change, Any that's true, it's true. But at the present moment, at the present moment, if you look at the evidence around us that we're aware of, you have, you have no option but to believe that the, that the universe is 14 billion years old and it began at a, uh, as a tiny speck, you know, so and that ex, you know, that expanded, 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 and has continued to expand down to our present times. I'm going to give you some uh, some 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 reasons for this. Um, so um, so the actually before I give you these reasons, just a little little uh, uh, little note that I want you to keep in your mind, um, which is that uh, that there's often a there's a tendency amongst Muslims, and this comes from the Christians, it starts from them, to downplay the value of scientific knowledge. Because people who have scientific knowledge don't believe in God and aren't Muslim. So we say, uh, well, it's kind of like Aesop's fable and the fox and the grapes. And so, you know, they have scientific knowledge, they don't believe in God, it's no good anyway. It's no good anyway, it doesn't. Uh, and so there's a there's a movement um, amongst many, many Muslims. It's a strong intellectual movement amongst Muslims, even amongst traditional uh, 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 scholars in the West to that, the, that, uh, to, uh, that what Muslims need is to be critical of science and, uh, and uh, not think that science gives you real knowledge and science is changing all the time. And that's a mistake. Okay, that's a mistake. That's not what I, and that's not, if you look at the old teachers, you know, listen, my teachers don't have this position. And I don't think any of the teachers in the Muslim world have this position. Any old distinguished teachers, none of them have this position. They, um, so one of my teachers, he's, over, he's in probably close to 80 in his 80s now. And uh, I had these conversations with him. You know, I went to him, I asked him about atoms, asked him about molecules, we talked about the Big Bang, we talked about, he's, he, he's kept up, he, he's kept up. And he didn't go to school. <laughs> he didn't go to school. He uh, he he taught himself how to read and read and write, and uh, and then he studied for the high school examinations, passed, went to college. But uh, so the uh, so this is so what this but what this uh, I guess the point that I'm trying to to convey is that I want that I want you to understand that 
science is great. Science is wonderful. And what we want, what we need to do is, and this is generally speaking with all modern knowledge, we don't want to push modern knowledge away and retreat into our books, but we need an integration. We need to bring scientific knowledge and mix it in a, uh, a, a integrated, not mix it haphazardly, but integrate it into the uh, into what our traditional scholars have left behind. And I'm going to illustrate to you how we can do that with the Big Bang. Okay. And 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 as uh, and as somebody who and as someone who um, understands the science and understands uh, the what the Quran says uh, in its ancient Arabic and understands what uh, you know what what what, what traditional Muslim theology is about. I can say with confidence that there that there, this is this integration it's not only is it possible but we have to make this integration and our ancient scholars did that with the science of their times so before i show you how to make that integration you have to take the fact that that, that big bang that the big bang theory is true and all of you know it's true because all of you go to school and that's what they teach you but when we come to religious circles, often there's a downplaying of what we learn in school. And that's, and that I, that's not, I, I, so I, it needs to be done properly. And that's actually, that's the goal of what I'm uh, doing at Basira is to uh, bring these two together. And so the Big Bang, how do you know the Big Bang happened? The Big Bang, it is, uh, uh, there are, so if you go back, a hundred years, go back a hundred years and you go, you land at 2020. So 1920 in the year 1920. Uh, and you, you ask people who look up at the stars, you know, what is this? Um, they, their knowledge of the things in the sky is not even close to what we have now. Now, uh, anyone with a high school education, will know that light from the sun takes eight minutes to reach us. And it's this distance away from us, eight light minutes away. And the moon is this, and the closest uh, star is this distance away. And then there's this other star and there's galaxies. We all learn these things. And so when we look at the stars, we know that we are actually looking at something that might have happened millions, perhaps billions of years ago, because light takes time to travel. And the further away the star, the longer it takes to reach us. And so what we see now is what was happening a very long time ago. So if you were in, uh, for most of our history, for most of human history, when we look at the night sky, this is not what people see. People just see dots. And they ha imagined, you know, like they gave some kind of fanciful explanations of what, what all, all of this is, but just they saw dots. And these dots, they move, they rise and set, because just as the sun and the moon rise and set, the stars also rise and set with the rotation of the Earth on its axis. So then they use this to uh, to measure the uh, to predict uh, rain and predict the seasons, because the uh, you, you, there, there's something called a solar calendar. So, but the point is that when they when you when you look up, you didn't didn't know anything. But there's a verse in the Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in Surah Al-Waqi'ah, he says, فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِمَوَاقِعِ النُّجُومِ وَإِنَّهُ لَقَسَمٌ لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ عَظِيمٌ إِنَّهُ لَقُرْآنٌ كَرِيمٌ Perhaps many of you know this verse. Um, it's an, uh, it's a, uh, it is, it's, it's, it's a really amazing verse. The reason why it's amazing is, um, if, for those of you who, who know a little bit of Arabic, um, I'll, you'll be able to follow this. For those of you who don't, inshallah, this will be an impetus. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. So it's the most, the ancient Arabic language is, uh, is, uh, is, it's the most beautiful language of, of all. Right. There's, uh, and I have no, uh, I can say that with complete confidence. So, uh, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this, in this verse, he says, he says, first of all, so he's swearing, but before he's swearing, uh, he's swearing by the positions of the stars and the, the word here, positions of the stars, 
position can mean can mean to fall and uh, and some contemporary scholars have have said that well actually when everything in the universe is rotating orbiting around other things and what is an orbit an orbit is free fall if you so what's an or orbit is if there's a pull of gravity gravity pulls and it just misses 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 and so gravity is a an orbit of a uh, a planet around the sun a moon around the planet it's it's free fall um so the so fala I, I I swear by the mawaqi which some might say it's these orbits of the of the, of the, of the of the stars and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says la la uqsim this la is for emphasis it says nay and it's to indicate that this oath is a really tremendous oath when you swear an oath in any language the 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 power of the oath is uh, is commensurate with the greatness of the thing that you are swearing by. So let's say I want to swear an oath. So I say to, uh, I say to, uh, uh, you know, I say to somebody, uh, a, a bad student who hasn't done their homework. And I say, I swear by this tiny piece of paper that if you don't do your homework, I'm going to fail you. And so what, what will that person do? He'll come and he'll flick this away. He'll say, <laughs> Not even flicking. <laughs> you flick it away. He says that this tiny piece of paper, big deal. That's not a good oath. So when you swear an oath, you need to swear an oath by something that is tremendous. So, uh, so Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, whenever He swears an oath by something in the Quran, it's an indication that it is tremendous. So in this verse, Allah says he, He's He's swearing by the stars, but there are there's several things in the oath that that are there to, that the purpose of those things in, in in the arabic language is to tell the listener that this is a really really big oath but you have no idea how big it is <coughs> the first is by this la fala uqsimu la nay in other words that this is it's a really tremendous oath la uqsimu bi mawaqi'in nujum and then there's a parenthetical statement because the uh, the you can actually omit this the next you can you can the next uh, verse and you can say فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِمَوَاقِعِ النُّجُومِ إِنَّهُ لَقُرْآنٌ كَرِيمٌ That's the oath. I swear by the positions of the stars, verily, this is an exalted Quran. It's a great Quran. But what's happening in the middle? It's in brackets. It's saying, nay, I swear by the positions of the stars. And وَإِنَّهُ لَقَسَمٌ وَإِنَّهُ لَقَسَمٌ عَظِيمٌ and very and really this is a really big oath and then it's not just this is a really big oath but within this parenthetical statement there's another parenthetical statement it's saying and this is a really big if only you know if only you knew how big it was it's a really big oath that it is that this is a exalted quran so so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says he says that this that he swears by the stars and he says this is a really really big oath meaning that when you look up you guys don't realize what you're looking at and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this is an oath that was sworn 1400 years ago and now when 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 i go back and i read this verse it makes my hair stand on end because the uh, the the fact that you're looking at things and you're looking back in time billions of years ago and there's uh you know the, the the universe is expanding and there's nucleosynthesis that happened at the beginning of the universe and there's fusion that's happening and there's supernova that are exploding and the the elements are being made and scattered throughout the universe and coming together um by the uh by the sunnah of gravity that allah has placed in this universe and forming plant it's it's it is if you understand if you read astronomy it's it's mind-blowing it makes you feel like you're nothing and that's the point because the universe is tremendous so so why why where am i going with this when i'm going with this we started off by saying that that if you went back 100 years ago and you were to ask somebody to look at the sky and say uh what uh, they would just see uh, its dots but you have this verse of the quran that's saying that it's really something tremendous then there was a series, there were a series of discoveries. In 1929, there was a scientist. So actually before that, in 1917, 
Um, Albert Einstein, he, uh, he formulated his uh, equations uh, and his famous equations and, and his, his theory of relativity. And in, his, uh, in these equations that express the theory of re relativity, um, they seemed to say that the universe is expanding. He said, no, 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 that can't be the case. Everybody knows the universe is not expanding. Because if you look at the universe, if you look up at the stars, everything appears to be the same. It appears to be static and unchanging. And, uh, and uh, the scientists at that time, and for, for the, you know, if you, people who aren't religious, when they, when they would study the universe, they would look at it, they would say, it's always been like this. It's unchanging. The universe doesn't change. So, the, uh, so, he, so, so Albert Einstein in 1917, he actually, he inserted a number, a constant into his, uh, into his equations uh, because he said, of course, the universe can't be expanding. It has to be static. And, uh, and he, later on, he called it his biggest blunder. So uh, just over 10 years later, there's an American scientist by the name of Edwin Hubble. And he was observing the stars and he observed this thing called redshift. So when you when you uh, so when you when you study, uh, you can actually uh, when you look at um, you can when uh, you know Einstein, uh, Newton, his the famous thing, the, the light from the sun coming and hitting a prism and then diffracting into the into the colors of the rainbow. So you, we can we can take the light of the sun and diffract it in this way, and we can take the light from any star and we can diffract it in this way. And when we diffract it, we can, uh, we can tell by looking in th this diffraction has lines in it. And there's a reason why these lines are there. Uh, it's to do with the uh, positions of the electrons. And when the electrons, they move up an energy level, move down an energy level, they absorb a certain amount of energy and this or, or release. And then, so they leave these lines. And so you can, you can look at the, you can look at, you can take the light that's coming from the star, diffract it, look at these lines, and you can say that this star has helium in it. This star has hydrogen in it. This star has lithium in it. And you can, you can, you, you can, you can come, you can see the elements that are there in the star. So, because these elements have special, these, these, they have a special pattern of lines that you call spectral lines. So, uh, Edwin Hubble, he looked up and he did this and he looked at these lines and he saw that these lines, they have been, they're, they're on stars that are far away, they're shifted. They're shifted towards the red end of the electromagnetic spectrum. In other words, their wavelengths are getting longer. So violet, so you know, high school, vid, big, your, violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, red, red is the is the and then you have infrared and ultraviolet. So so the lowest energy is uh, red, and it's the uh, longest wavelength. So he found that the, these stars that are moving, the stars that are further away, these lines have shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. In other words, things are their wavelengths are getting longer. Why are their wavelengths that getting getting longer? Because they're moving away from us, and the further away the star the faster they're moving away. This is known as Hubble's law. So this was a revolutionary discovery. It completely changed the way that scientists looked at the universe. Because what this means is, it means the universe is expanding and it means that the universe is not static. It means that when we look around it and we look at the, we look at the sky and we see these stars, we see these stars, we, it means that these, that even though it appears to be unchanging, it's actually, changing it's changing it's expanding so edwin hubble's uh, discovery has been confirmed since 1929 by discovery after discovery after discovery after discovery so one of the famous discoveries is called cosmic background microwave radiation in the 1960s uh, some uh, uh, astronomers at bell laboratories they what they found was that uh, there there's there's energy microwave energy that is that pervades the universe everywhere so when i normally when you have energy you have an energy source so uh, the sunlight that's coming from the window over here i see this light where is it coming from it's coming from the sun that's shining up there 
at night I see moonlight, where is it coming from? It's coming from that moon that's over there that's reflecting the light of the sun. But the cosmic background, micro, microwave radiation, is energy that's everywhere in the universe and it has no source. Where did it come from? So this, so what they say is that this is, this is, they consider this to be direct evidence for the Big Bang because the Big Bang, which was neither big nor a bang, but it's this, you, it's tiny. When things, when the universe was tiny, it was really hot. And then it expanded and it cooled down. And, uh, and the uh, you know, elements, elements, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the elements and they came into, put them into stars and planets and these things. But there, there was a, there was a temperature. There was a temperature that the universe had that cooled down as the universe expanded. And that temperature, it pervades the universe as this microwave radiation. And so this energy that we see, what's its source? Its source is the Big Bang event. So, uh, so the, so this is other, this is, Confirming evidence for the Big Bang. You can look at the you, there's you can model mo if the Big Bang were to be true, then then this is what things would be like. And you can you can there you look at the elements in the universe. So the 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 universe is seventy five percent hydrogen and twenty three percent helium and two percent other elements. And so where where did this where did this helium come from? This twenty three percent helium it's too much to have formed through nuclear fusion in stars. And so you, it needs to it needs to have come it needs to have been there at the beginning of the universe. And if you do the math, and uh, you, uh, you 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 you'll work out that that at the beginning of the universe, because of the temperatures and because of the properties of atoms and of, of atoms and electrons and protons, because of those properties, it it will result in a universe that is seventy five percent hydrogen and twenty three percent helium. And there's many, many other discoveries. And there's so many discoveries that now it's now considered it's consensus. It's scientific consensus that the universe began to exist. Because why did it begin to exist? Because if the universe is, is big now and it's expanded, take it back in time, it was smaller. Take it back in time, it was smaller. Take it back in time, it was smaller. Take it back in time, it was smaller, 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 smaller. smaller. And then it disappears. So it actually looks like the universe began to exist. And um, philosophers will debate this. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, but scientists, uh, I don't. We, we'll uh, philosophers are a little bit stubborn. But but scientists, they uh, they are. There's they. they it's consensus. There's, how old is the universe? Fourteen billion years. Thirteen point eight billion years old. And the universe began to exist at the. Their, their universe has an age. This is in the scientific community. This is established fact. It's established fact. And this is actually evidence for how strong the evidence is because nobody wants to believe this. Nobody wants to believe the scientists who aren't religious. They don't like Christianity. They don't want to believe that the universe began to exist because that's what re religious guys say. And, they, and the religious guys, they aren't scientific, they aren't modern, they aren't sophisticated. And that's another reason why you know, I wanted to, to say that, that that's, that's, why, that's why I feel, that's, that's why the Basita Project is, is uh, uh, you know, I started the Basita Project because, because religious guys are really intelligent and they have a better understanding of what's happening in the universe than somebody who's not religious. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and we need to be able to see this. It strengthens our faith and it's true. This is the way that it is. So the scientists, they don't want to believe. They don't want to believe that the universe began to exist, but yet they have to. That's why there's consensus. So the universe began to exist 14 billion years ago. So this is now you study this in science. So this is, so it's the topic of this, of this lecture. It's the Bedouin. So now we know what the Bedouin, the Big Bang. Now we know what the Big Bang, and the Kalam cosmological argument. So the Kalam cosmological argument. Now we're going to start the, this this aspect. This is the integration now. So the Kalam cosmological argument. It it's called the Kalam cosmological argument for the existence of God. So this is it's all philosophical terms. Uh, you have 
So you have a cosmological argument. There's many kinds of arguments for the existence of God in Western philosophy. And we don't agree with, with, with all of these arguments. Um, and uh, so, uh, so, you know, one of the things that, you know, I'll throw out now, and I have another lecture online that you can watch. I gave it MCC um, about a year ago or six months ago. Um, it's actually, so the argument by design is not a good argument for the existence of God. Okay, so, uh, uh, and you will, this will, uh, this will kind of throw you off, but I, I, I don't have time to get into it here. There's another lecture that's available online. You, you can listen to it, but that's the, the, uh, but the, the, the argument that's in the Quran that the Prophet Sallallahu taught us is the cosmological argument. What's cosmological? Cosmological comes from cosmos. Cosmos is the universe. A cosmological argument for the existence of God is an argument for the existence of God from the cosmos, from the universe. The universe is evidence for the existence of God. And this is what you see in the Quran, verily in the creation uh, of the heavens and the earth and the alternation of the light, night and the day. And it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the universe. The universe is evidence for the existence of God. How? In the way that the Prophet explained to the Bedouin. So the so there's this cosmological argument. So there was a in the 1970s there is a Christian philosopher by the name of William Lane Craig, Bill Craig, and he said that uh, he said that uh, so he said so first of all there's two there's two things. First thing is that the Big Bang, the fact that the universe began to exist, has implications, has implications for the existence of God. That's one thing. And we're going to look at that in a second. The second thing is that actually Muslims for 1,400 years have been presenting philosophical arguments independent of modern science, demonstrating that the universe began to exist and using that as evidence for the existence of God. So this is, so this is, uh, uh, this is actually this is and uh, and uh, so William Lane Craig, Craig he brought this out and so why is this relevant? It's relevant because the Christians, Christians, um, they have their own uh, theology slash philosophy, um, and it uh, you know, one of the most prominent figures in Christian theology philosophy is a figure called Thomas Aquinas. Uh, Thomas Aquinas was uh, um, venerated by the Catholic Church as a saint, and uh, what did he do? He merged the thought of Aristotle with Christianity. He merged Aristotelianism with Christianity. Where did he learn Aristotelianism? He learned it from the Muslims. He took, uh, there, there's, it's established that the knowledge of Aristotelianism that Thomas Aquinas had came through people like Ibn Rushd and Ibn Sina. Uh, they both had an influence on him in Europe. Uh, so Ibn Rushd, Ibn Sina, they're mentioned famously in the West and uh, they're Aristotelian or Neoplatonic. Um, but actually in our, our history, in our uh, own intellectual history, scholarly history, they're marginal figures, they're not important. So Ibn Rushd and Ibn Sina, they actually, they have very problematic beliefs. Al-Ghazali, the, the takfir of Ibn Sina. And he had, and he and Ibn Rushd, um, Ibn Rushd wrote a refutation of Al-Ghazali. And uh, so these are figures that you find are venerated in the West. Why are they venerated in the West? Because these are the channels through which Western civilization became Western civilization. These are, they, it came through the Muslims, but that's not our tradition. In our tradition, they're marginal figures. In our, in our, uh, so in our tradition, people who are prominent are people like Ghazali, are people like Fakhruddin al-Razi. And, and, and so, so uh, in uh, Aristotle, Aristotle actually, he believed that the universe did not begin to exist. Aristotle believed that the universe is static, never began to exist. It's always, it has no beginning in time. And that was the position of Ibn Sina. And it seems like it might have been the position of Ibn Rushd as well. And this is highly problematic from, a, from, from an Islamic perspective because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the heavens and the earth. Um, so because uh, Thomas Aquinas, he took from these people, Aristotle through these people, it, there's this merger with Christianity and all of Western thought, all Western thought is a reaction to Christi Christianity. It's a reaction to, uh, uh, to Christian theology and Aristotelianism. 
and uh, and church and state and corruption and all of these things western western philosophy is a reaction to that so if you uh, so there's no muslim voice there they don't know about islam they don't know about our our tradition so in that's that's why in western in the western tradition they have no philosophical arguments for the fact that the universe began to exist and this argument is unique to the muslims and so, in other words, the Muslims, they have an argument for the, the, for the fact that the universe began to exist and it's independent of the Big Bang. You can actually think and reason and say, ah, the universe must have begun to exist. So the, this argument, William Lane Craig, because of the Big Bang theory, he, uh, he said, wait a minute, look, science has discovered this. You can actually show it rationally. You can show it philosophically. And people like Ghazali did it. And here it is. And he gave it a name and he called it the Kalam. What's Kalam? Kalam is traditional Muslim theology. He called it the Kalam, cosmological argument for the existence of God. And this has now become a very important argument for the existence of God in Western philosophy. There's people who've written refutations of it, defenses of it, expanded it, modified it. There's, it's, a, it's a key argument. Because, and, we're, and, and, and so how did it come? It came from Big Bang, Muslim, Muslim Muslim arguments being you know being brought together, and it's now uh, it's now uh, so it's now very you you can Google it you can uh, you can read about it in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, um, uh, or actually better than that you can uh, study it at Basira, <laughs> because it's better to it's better to study um, our own arguments from our own tradition rather than hear it expounded by somebody else. There, there's subtleties. Um, you know, it's not possible, for example, to believe in the Trinity and believe in the Kalam cosmological argument. There, 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 this, is, this is a contradiction in terms. Uh, but yet, William Lane Craig does that. And so uh, there's the implications of the Kalam cosmological argument are they, 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 they uh, uh, do away with, Christian, uh, with Christianity, with, with core Christian beliefs if it's properly understood and applied, but it's not. So, uh, but there's this idea that's there. So what, so what is this philosophical argument? I'm not gonna get into it. Okay? I'm, not, I'm not gonna get into it because it, um, it will take some time. And, uh, and maybe at an, in, another, in another event, we can, we, we, can do something, we can do something like this. But for now, I just want you to kind of understand this. And we're just going to go to the Big Bang. And we're going to look at the Big Bang and see how it's evidence for the existence of God. So the Big Bang is uh, uh, is a uh, it's the universe began to exist, and so what made it exist? And so let's pause it. Let's do the same thing that we began this this, this lecture with. So what, how do we begin this lecture? You have this weak person. He's leaning on something, leaning on someone, leaning on someone all the way back to the horizon. They disappear from you, and you say that at the end there's somebody who is standing or something that is not supported by anyone. So we can do the same thing with the beginning of the universe. The universe began to exist. It needs something to make it exist. Okay, let's posit something, anything. Let's call it an alien. Okay, philosophers, they like, uh, some of you have done philosophy, philosophers like strange thought experiments and they like aliens and all of these other things. So um, I, I, I don't, uh, I'm, you know, I've dabbled in philosophy, but I don't, uh, I don't consider myself a philosopher. And uh, I have, actually, I, um, that's another discussion. I can, we can, uh, you know, some other time we can, we can, we can talk about it. But they, so they like, so they, the world of philosophers say, okay, well, an alien made it. So, they, so, so a philosopher will come to you and say, why, why are you saying that God made the universe? Why wasn't it an alien, a really strong alien? Okay. And, uh, and they say, um, <laughs> so, so I'll tell you why it's not an alien. <laughs> so, uh, because, uh, so, okay, so let's say it's an alien. Okay, and then, and then let's say that that alien, you will say, okay, well, what made that alien? They'll say, well, another alien. Say, well, what made that alien? Well, some other alien. What made that alien? Some other alien. And let's take a line of aliens that extends to the horizon and they disappear from sight. What will you conclude? You'll conclude that at the end of the line, there is someone who was not made to exist by anyone. 
that made everything else exist. And that's God. Or that is that is a necessary being. A, so saying that's God is a, uh, there's actually, um, it's not accurate. Because God has other attributes apart from the fact that he's a necessary being. And there's arguments for those as well, which we are not, which we don't have time to discuss today. But in terms of, uh, in terms of like a, a simple, simple answer, that's that's the God that we know who exists and believe and in. He's the one who did not begin to exist, and no one made him because he doesn't need anyone to make him exist. He doesn't need anyone, and there has to be someone like that. Otherwise, nothing around us would exist. Just as when you see a group of people and they're leaning on each other all the way to the horizon and then they disappear, there has to be someone at the end who's not leaning on anything. Otherwise, at the, at the front here, they would, everybody would be lying on the floor. Everybody would be lying on the floor. So there's, I want to do one more thing, one more thing, and then we'll stop, inshallah, for, uh, for questions. Um, and that is that, that when you, if you really understand what's happening here, you'll actually, the Prophet wasallam, he said, all of these things, everything I've said, it comes from the Prophet wasallam. Everything I've said, it comes from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I've mentioned uh, a philosopher here, a big word here, a philosophical term here. These are just dress ups, just terminology to express something that is core and essential to our religion. Um, and that's, that's, what, that's what integration is about. What's integration with modern education? What's integration is you take this, this essence and there's this essence that is expressed by the, by the, by the scholars of our tradition. And you put, it into, you put it into economics and you see what the result is. And you put it into physics and you see what the result is. And what you see is again and again and again is that it gives you a clarity and uh, and uh, conviction that you wouldn't gain in any other way. So the so this is where I'm kind of digress. I'm coming back. So the the uh, this is a Quranic argument. And so what did the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam say? He said uh, he said that he said. Uh, that do you know what your Lord said in the Hadith in Bukhari? Uh, and they said that Allah and His Messenger know best. He says, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Asbaha min ibadi mu'minun bi wa kafir." That there are some of my servants who have come into the morning, and they are some of them believe in me, some of them disbelieve in me. He said, "Who is it that believes in me, and who is it that disbelieves in me?" He says that whoever says that we are, we've been given rain by the sheer blessing of Allah and his grace and his mercy, this person has believed in me. And whoever says that we have been given rain because of this star, the setting of this star. What's the setting of the star? You can actually, if you follow the, 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 uh, the, solar, the, the stellar calendar, stars they rise and set they rise and set at different points on the horizon throughout the year and so you can tell you, you can you can tell that when it when it when it right when it when it sets at this point in the horizon this is the month of uh, of uh, of uh, december which is a rainy season so when it sets at this point there's going to be rain so there's it's so what so there was an association that they would make between the setting of the star at this location and the coming down of rain and they would say that the star Made it, made it rain. It's actually there's in this kind of reasoning. It's it's completely the same reasoning that we use today. When we say uh, instead of talking about stars, we talk about the water cycle. There's 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 no difference in the reasoning. It's the same reasoning. Uh, so the so the, but the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said that whoever says that has that Allah says this person has disbelieved in me. Why? Because everything. In the universe is dependent on God. Everything in the universe is dependent on God. So when I when I made this uh, this thought experiment of somebody leaning back, landing on someone else, someone else, someone else, all the way to the horizon and then disappearing, when I did this thought experiment, um, this uh, actually I want there's what this if you, what this reveals is that 
that something that's dependent cannot remove the dependency of another thing. So this person, when I'm leaning on somebody, the person behind me is not really doing anything. He's not doing anything because he's leaning back on somebody else. And that person is leaning back on somebody else. So the one who is really doing something is the one who's at the end of the chain holding everybody up. So if you, uh, so, but the things in the middle, they're just, uh, they're just for show. They're just for show. And they're all upheld by this thing at the end. And if you extend this to the universe, everything in the universe is upheld by the power of God. And, uh, and that's, uh, and I think, uh, so I will, uh, I will actually, I'll stop there, inshallah. And uh, I think that's a good place to start, stop. And maybe we'll end with, uh, with uh, the words of the, uh, the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said that لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. There's no power nor movement nor, nor, uh, nor motion except by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. This is a treasure from the treasures of Jannah. And we've just seen how it's true, how it's factually true. And, uh, and, uh, and, that's what, um, and that's what the science of Islamic theology is about. The science of Islamic theology is about showing you why what you believe is factually true. And this is, this is part of our religion. And the Prophet taught us to think. And our scholars, they have a science. It's called the science of Kalam. And this series of three lectures that I'll be doing at Mizan, inshallah, I'll be showing you uh, um, glimpses of that science, inshallah. Go ahead, Sayyid. I'm done. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh, for that um, insightful talk. Mashallah, there's a, a lot to unpack there, and I'm sure we'll, a lot of us will need to go and revisit a lot of the, the concepts that you've, that you've brought up tonight. Um, we do have uh, four questions. If you'd like, I can, um, I can read them out to you. Um, um, okay. Okay. Um, Um, so the uh, the first question is yep yeah I'll, I'll read it out just so at least everyone um, at home can can follow along as well. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh Hamza, Jazakallah khair. The use of social science today is premised upon axioms of Western philosophy. How would you utilize the tools of kalam, tool sciences, um, ulum al ala, and rational sciences, e.g., logic, makulat, ontology, etc., to research into topics of social sciences and humanities today? aside from the legal engagement that we often see today? Um, okay, so, so this is, it's a, let, so let me, so this is, how does this, I mean, so what we, um, so the question, there's two kinds of sciences. There's something called the physical sciences and the social sciences. The physical sciences is uh, physics, chemistry, biology. And that's what I've been discussing today. There's also social sciences. Social sciences are like economics, sociology, um, uh, law, you know, uh, and uh, these uh, sciences that analyze uh, human beings as social creatures, um, psychology. So these sciences, they analyze us and they, uh, they then give recommendations about how we should live our lives. So a, an economist will say that, for example, he'll tell you uh, that, so Thomas Malthus, Malthusian theory, famous, that that uh, you know, two, two people get overpopulated, they start fighting with each other because they compete for scarce resources and there's wars and people kill and then it reaches stability and that's the cycle of human existence. And so, and then that's why in science, you have the invisible hand of greed, Adam Smith and, uh, and uh, capitalism. And so you, so these, and so how should, this is how you should do business. And this is rational and they'll actually say that you can be that if you allow greed to flourish, then people will be more altruistic. They'll, they'll care for each other more. <laughs> and they have arguments to show that. So, uh, so this is an example of something in the social sciences. The social sciences, they give recommendations for human behavior. So, uh, and they do that based on assumptions that they bring. So the questioner is asking, um, what do we do with the social sciences? And so, uh, so the questioner is saying that, well, what, what we do so far is that you have somebody will say that you know, a, a uh, somebody will come and say that interest is haram, and that's it. And or they'll come and they say, which is it, it is by the way. Okay, so I'm not. 
uh, and uh, or they'll come and they'll say that uh, that uh, uh, that that we should give charity and we shouldn't be greedy, which is true. And but they, so they'll they'll say these things, which we know, like human behavior, that how we should behave. We get this from the Sharia, from what the Prophet Sallallahu taught us how to behave. And so they'll say that, but then you have all of these arguments about why. Uh, we should, we should in economics, for example, we should function based on greed, and we should have infinite growth. We always want to get have growth more and more and more and more. Uh, and uh, then who cares about the environment and wars and destruction? But as long as there's growth, high GDP, that's great. So the so the uh, so, so how do we reconcile? How how does that conversation happen? And that conversation doesn't happen through the science of kalam. And it doesn't happen through any of the things that the questioner mentioned, ontology and, and makulat or anything. So that 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 actually, so I'll, that happens through. Um, uh, so I hear that you guys are doing uh, something on the Islamic sciences. So perhaps like, with uh, with uh, Sheikh Samir, and so maybe this, if you study these things, it'll, it'll help put put things into context. But um, basically, very briefly what happens is that the Islamic sciences, they stack up on each, on each other. So you have the science of Islamic law, which is, this is obligatory, this is unlawful, this is recommended, and that's what we study when we study, uh, you know, the rules of prayer, the rules of fasting, the rules of marriage and divorce. This science is stacked on top of something called legal theory. It's called usul al fiqh Usul al fiqh it, it enters into a deeper understanding, in it is the philosophy of Islamic law. And in it is how do you combine between reason and revelation, and free will and predestination, and uh, and uh, morality. What's the source of morality, and how do we discern what's what's beneficial and what's harmful? It's there in the science of legal theory. Legal theory then stacks on top of kalam, rational theology, which proves the existence of God and and uh, the genuineness of the messengers. And that stacks on top of logic, which is actually the prerequisite for all, all the sciences. So the, uh, there's a, there, so, so what, uh, what, uh, so the, uh, the so, so there's a, so the, the most important science here would be the science of legal theory, usul al um, along with tafsir and the science of hadith that's grounded in kalam. I would like to give more detail, but, uh, there's, I think that would require another, uh, another, another lecture. So, um, but uh, these are some, 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 you know, pointers that, uh, that, uh, that can. Yeah. Um, okay. The the next question we got is, uh, Sheikh, how do we tackle scientific theories, historical or present, that we cannot integrate? Uh, how do we present? Uh, how do we process them? So the, what we do is we look at, we have our own uh, something called epistemology. Epistemology is our theory of knowledge. So the, in our, our theory of knowledge looks something like this. It looks like, it says that, that, uh, that uh, uh, reason is a source of knowledge. What's reason? Well, we just, we, just, we just used reason to show that God exists. This is a source of knowledge. This is a way in which you can understand something about the universe. Science is also a source of knowledge and scientific reasoning, it has methods and there are, so, so what, how, how does scientific inference work? Scientific inference works through a process called, in Western philosophy, it's called IBE, inference to the best explanation. Um, and there's a lot of uh, philosophers have written a lot about this. Um, and this inference to the best explanation, you see a bunch of facts, and you say, okay, if this were to be the case, this would follow. And that's, that's how scientific, it's something called abductive reasoning. And, uh, and this would follow. And when you have enough number of data points, then it can give you certainty. So this kind of reasoning, it, uh, it is a sound form of reasoning. But you have to have all of the data points. So the uh, revelation, so we have uh, reason as a source of knowledge. Um, science is a source of knowledge, and uh, revelation is also a source of knowledge. So when I read the Quran, this is fact, because we can, inshallah, in our next lecture, next month, I, I'll show you how we know that the Quran is from God. And it, so if the Quran is from God, this is a data point. 
So what happens is that we have to we have to understand is that when in a scientific theory, they're not working with all of the data points. So they have this observation, this observation, this observation, this observation, but they don't have what we learn from the Quran and Sunnah as data points into that into that big picture. 